Draco Malfoy is a pretty two-dimensional character for most of the series. And he is not two-dimensional in The Half-Blood Prince. Right. So it's really brilliant to watch Rowling take a two-dimensional character and start to create layers of his character in a way that you start to define a lot of relatability to right. his vulnerabilities. We're getting a lot more depth to a lot more characters like mm -hmm. Snape, Malfoy. You know, we're learning things about Dumbledore and even Voldemort we're learning about. Mm -hmm. So I I just love, I love knowing all that stuff about characters and seeing that not everyone's good and not everyone's bad. Welcome to the Fiction Writing Made Easy podcast. My name is Savannah Gilbo, and I'm here to help you write a story that works. I want to prove to you that writing a novel doesn't have to be overwhelming. So each week, I'll bring you a brand new episode with simple, actionable, and step-by-step -step strategies that you can implement in your writing right away. So whether you're brand new to writing or more of a seasoned author looking to improve your craft, this podcast is for you. So pick up a pen and let's get started. In today's episode, we're diving deep into the first chapter of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. And once again, I'm joined by a very special guest, Abigail Perry, who is a developmental editor and the host of an amazing podcast called Lit Match, where she helps writers find the best literary agent for their writing and publishing careers. I will link to her podcast in the show notes, as well as where you can find Abigail around the internet. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, then you already know the deal about these first chapter episodes. But just in case you're brand new here, or in case you need a reminder, Abigail and I are taking a look at the first chapter in each of the Harry Potter books to see how Rowling hooks our attention and pulls us into the story. It's been fun to see how she develops not only as an author from book to book, but also how these first chapters change from book to book as well. So in today's episode, we're digging into the first chapter of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, which is my favorite book in the series. And we're going to analyze it on both the macro and the micro level. So basically we're asking, why does this chapter work? And then how does the scene or the scenes within the chapter work? So that's a very quick overview of what we're going to dig into today. You'll hear more explanation for everything once we get into the episode. So with that being said, let's go ahead and dive right into the conversation. I'm especially excited to get into this one with you because this is Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, which means we've reached your favorite book in the series. Yes. And I almost can't believe that we're almost done with the series. So no. it's bittersweet because yes, it's my favorite and I know we're going to your favorite next, but at the same time, I don't want it to be over. So I know. Same I don't thing love that. As if we were reading them again. I know. <laughs> So yes, this is my favorite book and I love this book mostly because we get to learn a lot about Snape and we see him do a lot more stuff. We understand him a lot more in this book. I also love Slughorn. Mm -hmm. He's just a fun character. Things are a lot more serious now, right? So I just love this book, but... That's funny, Savannah, because you're a Ravenclaw. We've talked about that in another episode. You being yeah. Ravenclaw, I'm Gryffindor slash almost Hufflepuff. Yeah. <laughs> and... Slughorn and Snape are both Slytherins. So it's yeah. interesting that you're drawn to both Slytherin characters. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I don't judge. My brother sometimes identifies as Slytherin. Other times he's a different house. But yeah, I think there's good and bad in both houses. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's, it that. seems like there's bits of every house in, in characters and well-rounded so. characters in general. Yeah. Well, yeah. Snape is also my favorite character in this series. And when I was teaching, I would literally have students stand up and go, ugh. Snape, yeah. how do you like Snape? And I'm like, you just don't understand. So <laughs> he's fascinating as a character. He yeah. is, he tugs at the heartstrings once we realize what's going on. And I even just, I literally got full body goosebumps right now, mm -hmm. not even saying anything other than we, when we find out what's going on. So I know. obviously it affects me. It's, yeah, it's my favorite book because I just love the big reveal. I love that, you know, Harry comes to understand him in a different way too. You know, the whole time we might not have been as angry at Snape as Harry, but now we're all coming to this big understanding and it's just like, it's magical. Yeah, I do think that Snape is one of the biggest reasons why the series is so successful because yeah. he really did keep readers, at least you, you and I both aged with the books. Right. So it at least like at that time and even still keeps you guessing on the idea of is he good or is he bad? And we think we get an answer in this. Book. Right. But and I remember, I don't remember the exact details, but I fully remember being in that place of like, I think I know, mm -hmm. and, you know going to the message boards and like, you know, wanting all the fan theories about which way Snape is going to go. And yeah, 
it was almost like you never knew when the twists were going to stop. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, and that's fun. And you don't. You don't until the clock is up, right? So I think that's the great thing. Now, it's really interesting as well, because this book involves Snape so much. And like you said, it has all these dark components. Before going back to read the first chapter, I assumed the first chapter was going to be when Snape makes the unbreakable vow. And it wasn't. That well, wasn't the first chapter. So you're going to give a summary of what the first yeah. chapter was. But. And I that's in the movie, right? We see that as the first scene in the movie. So that's probably what a lot of us remember. Yeah, I think I had a different memory because this is my favorite book. And I mm-hmm. probably like spent a way more time with it than is healthy. But yeah, I'm going to give us a summary. So we'll go ahead and do that now. This is so this is chapter one. We're following the muggle prime minister. So in this scene, he is waiting for a call from the president of a distant country. We don't know which one. And he's reading memos at his desk. We get the sense that the week has just been terrible because there's a lot of crazy stuff going on and he is getting blamed since he's in charge of the country. He hears a a cough coming from a portrait on his wall. And long story short, the minister of magic is coming for a meeting, whether the prime minister likes it or not. So the Minister of Magic, Cornelius Fudge, shows up and we get some context about their relationship over the past few years and how Fudge has been showing up a little too much for the Prime Minister's liking lately. But Fudge is here with some news. Voldemort is back and he is the one behind all the bad things and all the chaos that's happening right now. Well, Voldemort and his Death Eaters and the Dementors. So Fudge also tells the Prime Minister that the world is officially at war now that Voldemort's back. And to make matters worse, Fudge has been sacked. And now there's a new prime minister, Rufus Scrimmager. And oh, by the way, Fudge says he's about to come through that portrait to meet you right now, too. So he does. And the prime minister and Scrimmager meet. And finally, the prime minister explodes and says, why can't you guys just sort this out? You can do magic. Surely you can do something. And Scrimmager ominously replies that the other side can do magic, too. That's a great last line to leave us with. I got goosebumps again. Ah, well, it's your favorite and yeah. an amazing chapter. I love it. <laughs> amazing as this chapter is, it I found probably the most complicated chapter to analyze out of the first chapters so far. So we are at book six. Our expectation is that at this point, it's going to become a more complex story. We're getting into the darker aspects for sure. Like we'd started in four, definitely entered five. We're heavy in this in six and the whole first chapter kind of prefaces that. But it was really complicated to break down on a structural level, even though I was completely engaged throughout all of it. How did right. you feel? I agree. And I think I went back and forth around what that microstructure was for, I don't know, five or six different times. I had different versions. But it's funny because I did what what my gut feeling was about the structure, I ended up coming back to it, which I think is interesting because sometimes as writers, if we're doing stuff like this, we do need to listen to our gut. You know, we could, I mean, Abigail and I could even reason our way out of what we've come up with for you today. We won't, but we could because it's really easy to spin our wheels and come up with all these different answers. Definitely. And like all the first chapter episodes, what we are going to do today is we'll tackle quickly the big picture expectations that are set up using the seven key questions for first chapters. Like we pull these key questions from Paula Munay's book, The Writer's Guide to Beginnings. And then we're going to zero in and look at the scene level or the small picture level to analyze the structure of that scene. So the complicated debates that we had going into this. So right. let's start, of course, with the with the first seven questions. So we can talk about what are, how is this first chapter working on a big picture level and how does it create expectations for the book? And so that first question is about genre. It's what kind of story is this? And do we get a sense of that from this first chapter? So what do you think about that first question? So I think we're still in action territory. We've obviously upped the stakes again. Things are even more serious because Voldemort's back. Fudge tells us the world is at war. And even the muggles are seeing effects of Voldemort and his Death Eaters. Mm -hmm. Um, I also think we're still in YA territory. So, you know, similar to our answer for the last book. Yeah, definitely. And I do think even though five was dark in the beginning of six, we're going to hear about how the Death Eaters and Voldemort are at large here. And like you just said, Savannah, because now we're infiltrating the muggle world, Mm -hmm. it's much higher stakes. So amazingly, she's figured out how to raise death stakes once again. Right. (laughs) I think it would be interesting real quick to just kind of go over because you do say it's YA. I agree with you. It's YA. One of the defining factors when I'm looking for YA is the age of the protagonist and where we are on the maturity level as well to understand the tone and just like what uh, what a protagonist is going through in addition. But we both work with fantasy 
And I would just like to hear your points real quick. How would you define the difference between YA versus when you start to creep over to the adult fantasy section? And that's a good question because we could be approaching that territory, right? So in this book, I think, is Harry 16? I think he's 16, right? So usually we say adult is 18 plus, right? So for one, that kind of signals to us that we're in YA territory. I also look at like, this is not to say that adult stories can't have a big focus on romance. Of course they can, but YA is kind of known for that focus on romance. So I think we have that in this book with Harry and Ginny, right? And then Ron and Hermione and all that fun stuff. So yeah, I would say that's off the top of my head. That's my answer. Yeah, that's a good answer. I have found as well the difference between something like an epic fantasy series and then this YA fantasy series. And it sounds weird to say because Harry Potter is epic to me. Yeah. But it's one of those things where like when I look at Harry Potter, the world building in this book, in this series, is just mind-blowingly spectacular. And it is epic on its scale. But I don't see it as something as like a Middle Earth or the Brandon Sanderson, the Ways of Kings, like all of those areas. So I'm I'm just curious for you, like I would define those the Lord of the Rings, anything with um, Game of Thrones, all those ones is more of like that epic fantasy realm. Would you consider Harry Potter epic as well? I mean, it's so interesting, right? Because I think what is the definition of epic? Is right. it that it has far reaching stakes and consequences? And if so, then I mean, yes, this is what Harry Potter is, right? Right. But if we're saying, does it span a giant made up world? Not necessarily because we're kind of in a portal situation, right? Yes. Which is, it's more similar to something like the magicians, although the magicians still has fillery. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to say, yes, I think it's an epic. It has far reaching stakes. I still think it's YA. Mm Mm-hmm. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I I would call it epic in the sense of that the story is epic, but yeah. there is a containment to it. And it's interesting because like we can imagine how wizards live across the world through Harry Potter, but we are in Great Britain for the majority, right? And then there's Bobatan and Drumstrang who came in in A Goblet of Fire. So we are aware, we've talked about how Baltimore often is rumored to be in Albania, I believe. So we're aware of it expanding beyond this one area of the world. Right. But I don't know, but it's it's just interesting to me because like then when I think about, I mean, I love Lord of the Rings. So when I yeah. think about Lord of the Rings, like we are going across Middle Earth and we're right. we're doing the maps and things like that where yeah. I know, you're absolutely doing that. But majority of the time because we're at school and i think that was that is limited yeah Yeah. but i think that was part of the brilliance of it right like part of the brilliance of jk rowling's mastery of this world was that she learned how to bring magic to a school system right and i think if if we're thinking of epic as kind of a scale definitely books six and seven are the closest to i would agree with what i would call epic and in seven we know that we're we're not even at i mean we're at school a little bit but we're not really at school it's a different feel so yeah i think I don't think there's a wrong answer calling it epic or not. I mean, you look on the internet, there's like thousands of different answers of what an epic fantasy is. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. No, no, it's just, it's interesting to think about because I do say easily, this is for me, YA fantasy. Yeah. But we are reaching, we're creeping towards that area of when you cross over. So, yeah. Yeah, great. So question number two deals with plot. And that question is, what is the story really about? Yeah. And I think this chapter does a great job of telling us that, right? Like Voldemort is back. The world is at war. And also it's not just the wizarding world. It's the wizarding world and the muggle world. So it's the entire world. So we know we know that this is what Harry is going to have to deal with, obviously, especially after book five, where we learn about the prophecy and how only one can survive. So I think this first chapter does a great job setting that up. I love what you said there because it just it helped me think about some things as well. Voldemort is back. Voldemort was back in book five. Right. But not to the scale that he is in book six. And here's right. the key is that the ministry is in denial in book five. And now you just said the key word there. We're at war. Right. Right. So in book six, we are entering the war zone. We're in right. book five. We're trying to prevent the war from happening. I'm laughing a little because I just got goosebumps again. It's so funny. Like, I'm going to probably keep a tally of how many times I get goosebumps. I just love this book. The mark of a great story. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, I think exactly what you said. Totally true. The stakes have been raised in large part because the ministry now believes 
right? Mm -hmm. Or they're on the side of like, yeah, okay, we're going to get on board with this. We understand. Which means that on a grand scale, there will be equal parts of people standing against the evil that's arising and right. the evil that is actually starting to grow as well, right? Like giants, right. learn that giants are probably at large here. Right. The mentors have started to breed. Like there are big things that are happening now that are expanding that source of people. Right. Yeah. I just got goosebumps again. <laughs> Keep telling. That's going to Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. So question number three is going to do with point of view. Very yes. interesting for this first chapter in this book. And that question is who is telling the story? Yeah. And so I think we're in this opening chapter, like almost all opening chapters in JK Rowling's world, we start zoomed out with the omniscient point of view, and then we kind of zoom into the muggle prime minister. So we follow him as he deals with fudge and later scrimmager. Very interesting because for the majority of the story, we're going to go back to Harry Potter, right? Limited, right? Third person limited, right? Majority. But like yeah. you said, traditional for Rowling to zoom out, zoom in. This is another kind of, would you call this a prologue in disguise or is yeah. this not a prologue? Yeah. Okay. So then there's like almost a double prologue in disguise. Because I know. I was just going to mention <laughs> that, that in the yeah. next chapter, right, we're with Snape. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. Which is the very first time. So, okay, I got goosebumps again. It's the very first time we see his point of view. Yes. Which is so telling to the construction of the story because you can't show Snape's point of view and then not follow that up with unveiling who he really is. Right? Oh, my gosh. And when you think about that, yeah. So, sorry, spoiler alerts. This yeah. episode's going to have spoilers. It's just going to have spoilers. So turn back now if you don't yeah. want to. <laughs> but Snape is the half-blood prince. So as a reader for the first time, I think I constantly was guessing. But now as I analyze it, as you read that, like you just said, like, how is it not him? How do you, how do you not see it? Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's the surprise. Yeah, it's inevitable. Again. <laughs> yeah. I'm, it's crazy. I'm going to like, I don't know, freak out with all these goosebumps. But yeah, it's when you look at hindsight and you think about structurally, it makes total sense or yeah. construction wise, it makes total sense that something big is coming with Snape, right? Just, I know that's chapter two, but we get so ahead of ourselves because we and, love it. And Snape has done, she's done a really good job with narrative with Snape. Mm -hmm. I think because we have been with Harry Potter for the majority of the series, of course, like we have the ins and outs, but the majority, I'd be bold enough to say 90% at yeah. least. So, we're with Harry. And I think that's the idea here is that part of the tool with that is that we guess because Harry guesses. Right. And, you know, starting with book one, using the Snape as a red herring, like a blatant red herring. Mm -hmm. And then other stories where we're constantly torn between this idea of you trust Snape because Dumbledore trusts Snape. Right. And you have to have faith in Dumbledore. So it's kind of one of those things like Dumbledore is the only light in this book, the hope place, the bomb of hope for Harry and for the Wizarding community, right? Harry is too, of course. But without Dumbledore, we have no direction. Right. And it's just so interesting because you're just you're just going throughout the whole series like you have to trust Dumbledore. So what makes this book so moving is that at the end of this, of course, we feel like it's the biggest betrayal when Snape right. kills Dumbledore, but it's actually like a whole plot. Yeah. <laughs> a little body chills there. Yeah. Yes. But and it's so funny because had we ever had Snape's point of view before, we J.K. Rowling wouldn't have been able to pull off this emotional payoff that we're going to get over the next two books. That's right. And then this chapter really is is to create the sense, because we're with the prime minister, mm -hmm. this chapter is to create the sense of danger, the level of danger that's happening. We're really given news, but we're given news in a way that doesn't info dump. And I think that's why this chapter exists, because yeah. it could be easy to info dump all of this information. And even like in the beats, right? Because there are a lot of beats, actually, because there's right. it weaves backstory in a way that they act like many scenes within the scene. And right. I think that that's a valuable tool in this chapter. Right. And even, you know, after you said that about why this chapter exists, it wouldn't have worked in something like book three, four or five. Right. Because nothing necessarily affected the muggle world to this scale. So now it's working because we have to inform the muggle prime minister, who is our point of view character, how bad this really is. Right. But if we ever had seen, let's say, a fudge point of view in the last book, it wouldn't have been as impactful or effective. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And I think that what you just said there, the level of danger and how it's coming, how basically it had to be the prime minister for this, because we've had book three, Prisoner of Azkaban, where they talk about Sirius Black on the news. Right but now there's there's too much to contain. Right. So there right. has to be a meeting, which leads us kind of into this question about character, which is question number four. 
and the idea of which character should the reader care about the most. Right. And this is fun because it shows the stakes. I, as a reader, care about everybody. Mm -hmm. I want everybody to be safe. But if we want to drill into specifics, I care about the Muggle Prime Minister because, you know, personally, I've had experience like him where you're kind of talked over and, you know, you just feel like something's out of your control. Mm -hmm. So I related to him. I felt bad for him. I, of course, feel worried and bad for Harry. I feel bad for Fudge because... Mm -hmm. You know, he got fired. Nobody likes that. He wasn't maybe the best prime minister, but I don't know. Maybe we'll say he tried his best. I don't know. And then I also feel, of course, bad for the entire wizarding world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I second all of that. It's interesting when you talk about fudge. I had no sympathy for fudge in book five. <laughs> I was just really infuriated with all of his behavior yeah. as you were meant to be, right? Because if you're right. on Team Harry, you're infuriated by all the literally like scandals and lies that he's creating to make right. his own name better. But I think the idea here is that this first chapter, I feel really bad for him. Yeah. And I actually think I get a taste of more, a lot more strength than I anticipated from his character. Even like in Chamber of Secrets, it, when we first meet, there's a chapter called Cornelius Fudge when he takes away Hagrid, Azkaban. Even then, like there's some sympathy because you can see he doesn't want to do it, but he has a lot of pressure from parents and things like that. And he's, he constantly seeks Dumbledore's counsel. Right. And then five, he just loses it. So you're just like, whoa, you're off the charts on this. Well, and I think we kind of feel bad for him in a way because we can tell he's easily influenced and swayed yeah. and he might not be like the strongest prime minister. Which is kind of interesting because then we get Scrimmager, who we can tell is like, you know, a lion, very right? strong presence. And right. he's going to have opinions. He's going to fight for the world, whether that whether his actions are good or bad. We don't know yet, but there's a very big difference. For sure. I'll just, I'm going to read a little bit of sure. that to just kind of describe that because we think, and for most of the chapter, we do think that Fudge still is the Minister of Magic. And then it comes out that he's not the Minister of Magic anymore. He's been fired three days ago, right. but he's staying on as advisory council. And Scrimmager has been appointed. And when he comes out, the prime and this is because it's the prime minister's perspective. So it says the prime minister's first foolish thought was that Rufus Scrimmager looked rather like an old lion. There right. were streaks of gray in his mane of tawny hair and his bushy eyebrows. He had keen yellowish eyes behind a pair of wire rim spectacles and a certain rangy loping grace, even though he walked with a slight limp. There was an immediate impression of shrewdness and toughness. The prime minister thought he understood why the wizarding community preferred Scrimgeour to fudge as a leader in these dangerous times. So it's interesting because that's a pretty amazing description of a character. And the limp kind of reflects like Mad-Eye Moody and stuff like that. But he also is like super blunt, like the way he treats the prime minister and things. So you can kind of see that he's rough around the edges to maybe a fault. But his bravery is is what they need in this time and, and his decisiveness is what they need in this time. Yeah. But all this is saying this time, because who we are, are afraid for is, like you said, everyone. Yeah. And on that note, I actually put a note in my comment section about how I love the way Rowling uses what I call character hooks. So like you said, the limp, the tawny hair, the lion-like appearance to help cement who that character is and kind of what they are like in our mind. So I thought it was fun. Like Fudge has a bright green bowler. He's fidgeting with it nervously the whole time. That is very telling of his character that we've come to know. And then like you were just reading, Scrimmager looks like a lion. He moves very feline-like. Like, you know, we just, we get the vibe of these two very distinct characters. And imagine if we didn't have, if they were both in business suits with cropped hair, it would not be the same. So no, and it wouldn't. And I think, I think some redeeming factors with using like those character descriptions for Fudge are that while he's fidgeting with his bowler and things like this, we see his behavior is not denial anymore. Like mm -hmm. when he, he kind of like laughs about, of course I was fired. Yeah. And and he doesn't cower away. He agrees to stay on his advisory council. So there are some redeeming qualities to him. In right. this. He's but not I, giving up. Right. He's not giving up. But then it's what I think is really interesting, because, of course, like this series is about Harry Potter. So you're anticipating that, of course, we're, we're now worried for all the victims, which is essentially everyone who's not a dark wizard, mm -hmm. including Muggles. Right. But we're also afraid for Harry. And there was a line in here that we, well, we mentioned Harry because in backstory, the first time that Fudge comes or the second, one of the times that Fudge comes, he mentions Harry Potter's name. I think it's the, the first time. And then later, there's one quick line about Harry towards the end that Fudge mentions. 
Oh, I have a note about this too. When Scrimmager, he talks about how Scrimmager has been trying to persuade the boy. Yes, 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 yes. He's he's writing to Dumbledore. He says something about if he could have just persuaded them and he kind of insinuates that he might still be minister if if Dumbledore could have only persuaded the boy, right? So do you, do you remember what that's about? Yeah, so they want him to basically make propaganda that everything's okay. So yeah. interesting. So it's once again, even with knowing that, and even though it's hinted at, and we don't know for sure, of course we care about Harry again, because once again, Harry is just in the middle of it without being asked to be in the right. middle. Right. Well, and I mean, in a way he wants to be in the middle of it, but he doesn't want the like drama of being the poster boy for the minister and he doesn't, or the ministry. He wants to do it in the way that to him makes sense and is effective where other people want to use him for different things. Right. Right. Including Voldemort. I mean, literally everybody wants to use Harry, so. Mm -hmm. Well, he's the chosen one. So. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Okay, so now let's go look at question number five. And that question deals with setting. And the question is, where and when does the story take place? Right. So we are in the prime minister's office, which I believe is in London. And Harry is 16. So it's his 16th year. We can do mm -hmm. the math on what year that takes place. Was there any mention about the season? I don't think there's actually any description that insinuates the season, but I think our assumption is summertime because yeah. we haven't heard about Hogwarts back to school yet. Yeah. They talk about where the two, the two murders happen. So we're going to learn that Amelia Bones was murdered, which is really sad. Right. It's really a bummer when she dies. And we also kind of start to learn that anyone is up for game with these mentionings of big people who have been killed. And Ellen Vance is the other one who's killed. So we learn about kind of the whereabouts of where those two were murdered. So a general sense of area, but we're in right. the prime minister's office during all of this. So, right. Yeah. A bridge has collapsed, things like that. Okay. Yes. All right. So question number six deals with core emotion. And the question is, how should the reader feel about what's happening? Yeah. So we are worried. We are scared. We're concerned. In a way, I'm sure that a lot of readers are like, okay, probably it's going to work out, but we don't know how and we don't know what kind of losses we'll experience because we just lost Sirius. So we know now that certain characters are not off the table in terms of who could die, which, you know, spoiler alert in this book, we get a huge loss, which I think is another reason why I like this book and, you know, thinking about it now in hindsight. I hate that Dumbledore dies, but I love like I because I have a thing with death, I guess. Like I love I don't know if love is the right word. I enjoy stories where someone is affected by death because I have been affected by death. Mm -hmm. And it's something that as a reader, I just relate to, I guess. So I love I love that part of it. I love how it forces Harry to become his own person. Mm -hmm. Not that he's not already, but it forces him to kind of step up. Right. But yeah. Yeah, I agree. I'm for whatever reason, I gravitate towards grief and death as well. I think it's something that helps me cope yeah. uh, with my emotions about things. And I particularly, I like stories where we learn about characters who die with dignity. Right. And I think that we start to really see the heroes of this story and if they do die, how they die. And, right. And, and I think, yeah. Well, I was going to say, going back to the action genre, sacrifice and life and death, I mean, obviously are huge parts of it, but sacrifice is something I don't know that we've talked about too much on the podcast. So to me, that's something I really associate with the action genre. And in a way, the death we're getting from Dumbledore, the way he's going out is kind of a sacrifice. Oh my gosh. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's on his terms, really, which is amazing. Right. Yeah. Well, and he's it's Snape is also sacrificing to kind of save Malfoy's soul in a way. Like oh, he doesn't yeah. want to damage the boy and because Malfoy's basically been contracted to kill Dumbledore. Mm -hmm. So yeah, lots of sacrifice. Which is really interesting that you talk about that. And I know it's a little bit sidebar yeah. uh, of, and like kind of probably a little sidetracked, but I'm going to say it anyway. We don't see it in this first chapter. We actually see in the second chapter because we learn that Draco has been given the task of killing Dumbledore and he's just a boy. Like, and, I, and Narcissa is the one that goes to Snape for help because he is just a boy. Right. And basically it's a vendetta for Voldemort He's mad about Lucius messing up the orb retrieval. So right. he wants to essentially, he wants Draco essentially to fail. I feel like he doesn't want to, like if it works out for him, great. But it, if he does, like whatever. Yeah. Kind of he doesn't revenge care. against it. But I'll have to say Draco Malfoy is a pretty two-dimensional character for most of the series. And he is not two-dimensional in the Half-Blood Prince. Right. So it's really brilliant to watch Rowling take a two-dimensional character and start to create layers of his character in a way that you start to define a lot of relatability to right. his vulnerabilities. 
I think that might be why another reason why I love this book so much is that we're getting a lot more depth to a lot more characters like mm-hmm. Snape, Malfoy. You know, we're learning things about Dumbledore and even Voldemort we're learning about. Mm-hmm. So I I just love, I love knowing all that stuff about characters and seeing that not everyone's good and not everyone's bad. That's why I, I gravitate to this because I like yeah. to see, I mean, they're not, Snape is an, kind of an anti-hero, but basically like I like to see that there's a lot more to someone that meets the eye. Right. And that even evil has turned evil for some reason, right? right? If you've started to lean more on the shadow of who you are as a human being, because it's light and dark in all of us, there's yeah. a reason for that. And it's interesting to see how characters start to choose where they're yeah, going to go. We get a ton of Voldemort's backstory in this book, right? Oh, my God. So, like all of his yeah. lessons with Dumbledore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I love. I I'm a, I guess I'm a sucker for an antagonist. I love a good origin story. So that's part of it too. But I just feel like this book in general was such a payoff for the entire series. Yes. It's like all the little nuggets that we've been questioning, we've been strung along with, we're getting answers. And then, of course, I know we're way ahead of ourselves, but we're going to go into book seven where it's like the final payoff. Mm-hmm. So it just is such an exciting time to be in the Harry Potter world. Rowling does but- a, an exceptional job at creating those setups and paying them off at the right time, just as Dumbledore helps Harry pay off who he is at the yes. right time. So it's it's very well executed. Okay, and that yeah. kind of brings us to question number seven in these key question in these seven key questions, and that's about stakes. Mm-hmm. So we we understand the core emotion, we understand life and death is on the line. So yes, right. life and death stakes. But ultimately, as a whole, and how this first chapter sets up expectations for what that is, why. Should the readers care about what happens next? Well, we're at war, right? So we've been told literally it's not just Harry's life. It's not just Dumbledore's. Everybody's at stake. We're at war. This is huge. So we care. Basically, it's about mass destruction. I remember a different story, but the the Dark Knight series, Christopher Nolan's Batman series, The Dark Knight. And that was always so interesting to me because it became really dark in that Batman. And of course... The Dark Knight with the Joker. Here we have like a, a villain who is just set on making the world burn. Right. And Voldemort is power hungry. So Voldemort wants to rule. He has a little bit more motive than just make the world burn, but he wants to make the world burn. Well, especially you know? the muggle world. He's right. just like, you don't even deserve to be here. Any Well, really anyone who speaks out against Isn't him, it? but he's even cruel to his Death Eaters. I so know. <laughs> it's it's interesting to see where I mean that's where it's like you start to even gain sometimes sympathy for Death Eaters, not much sympathy, but Draco Malfoy I gain sympathy for because he's just caught. Well, all the Malfoys yeah. really. We start to see that Lucius isn't re- very in control of his situation either. No, I have the least amount of sympathy for him because I feel like his choices have put him in that position, and he's totally. still kind of he doubles back. But Narcissa is a mother just trying to protect her son. Mm-hmm. And also it's just kind of like she's a, another thing about being born into something versus what you choose. So it's interesting like you have right. Sirius Black, who we've lost now. And yeah. with, with him being one of the few Black family members that rebelled against the family legacy and being like basically like exiled from that family to the point where his face was burned off of the family tree. Right. and being, But him being proud of that, right? Because he had influences. And I think that's that's something that's that is important in all of these stories. Again, speaking to these stories that have high stakes of life and death, those stakes are not meaningful unless we care about the characters whose right. lives are in peril. And basically this idea here of how do you start to do that? How do you start to create a sense of care and concern for these characters who are life and life, life and death are on the line? And you can start to see kind of the influences around them. Do they have adequate mentors? And I, and I think that's a big thing. Harry has the best mentor, arguably the best mentor I've ever seen in any series ever, ever any story ever. Even when he dies, he finds a way to still be <laughs> a mentor. It's unbelievable. So it's kind of one of those things where it's like if, and he has the Weasleys and he has all these positive influences, Malfoy is raised in a family of negative influences. So it's kind of one of those things where you look at like, it's interesting, like Sirius Black flaws that he had, he, if he didn't have James Potter, then maybe he would. I mean, I think that he's chosen for Gryffindor, but basically this idea of like yeah. influences are important. And we start to see that in the character depth level here of who are you surrounded by and how does that help you ground yourself in making yeah. choices? How does it change your worldview? And how does that worldview and internal character arc story 
impact the reader's concern for life or death. Exactly. Yeah, it's all related. And we're fleshing it out a lot more in this book, which helps raise the stakes, even though the stakes are already raised in general. Mm -hmm. So so let's turn to the scene level now, because I think that we've got a good idea of what the big picture is with this first yeah. chapter. The execution yeah. of structure in the scene and yeah. how it starts to move us, advance the plot, develop the characters. Those are the two things that at least I always look for, how do we use the structure to advance the plot, develop the characters along with other details. Right. And so I always like to start with the point of view character's goal. So what is the prime minister's goal in this scene? That is an interesting question. Because I think ultimately what's happening when the prime minister sets up with this scene is that we're learning about how he just, I think he just wants to find stability, essentially. Like he wants to, I mean, a lot of it deals with his 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 place as prime minister. He kind of fears for his job a little bit because the bridge has collapsed, the unexpected deaths have happened, the hurricane and he's resentful because I think he's watching the news or he's thinking about it, but there's a campaign opponent who's basically blaming him for everything. And it really aggravates him because he's like, I have no control over hurricanes. We just redid this bridge 10 years ago. It's not like we haven't invested in this. How right. could they say that there wasn't enough police control where the murders were? So he's aggravated by this. So his want, I think, when we first open up in these first pages is basically... <laughs> He wants chaos to go away or blame to go away from him. Like that's right. what he initiates. And then as we move into the story and we get the structural scene, the inciting incident and things, I think that that it, the want is aligned, but it shifts slightly based on the circumstances. Yeah. And so if if I were working with you as a writer and you told me that answer, I'd be like, that is great context to like how he's feeling, what he wants in general. And then I'd go, but what is he specifically doing or wanting in this scene? Yeah. So I would push you a little harder. And I would say it's something like we see him literally going through reports and paperwork kind of mindlessly because, like you said, he's distracted by all this other stuff. But he's really waiting for his meeting with that faraway country person to start. So that's like his goal, right? A mm -hmm. specific goal. But the context you painted is all if we didn't have that, we wouldn't understand like why he's mindlessly going through papers and all that. Um, mm -hmm. so I would just go a layer more specific, but that's me. Well, no, I love that you push me because <laughs> if you, if you're listening to this, this is why Savannah is so good at her job. Because, no, no, she really is. She's, she's the best. So <laughs> she, and I'm so lucky because I constantly learn more and grow in Minecraft because you're always pushing me. So I love it. This, this is like a huge benefit to me. So just say it again for the listeners one you more time. Blushing. <laughs> well, well, you don't need to blush because it's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but you, know, you also are humble as well. That's nice. But anyway, so just one more time for the listeners, you would say specifically the want is. Yeah. So what Abigail had relayed was kind of the general context of what he wants, right? In general, mm -hmm. he wants the country to restore to order and he wants to stop being blamed for things. But that's not. And the reason I'm poking at this is because that is not going to make him have agency. That's right. Which we will see that he doesn't have much no matter what, but that kind of goal doesn't translate to something in the moment. Mm -hmm. So his specific goal in the moment is to go through some reports and paperwork that is on his desk. They're on his mm -hmm. desk while he waits for the next meeting to start in a few minutes. Okay. And now this is really interesting. What he's trying to do is like, I think you said in the summary, he has a call with the president. We don't know yes. what president, yeah. but he has a call with the president. So that is going to help you understand when an inciting incident actually happens. Right. And the whole conflict he faces and like why this is a conflict. Because if we didn't establish this goal of waiting for the president and then the prime minister or the minister of magic shows up, who cares? He's just doing paperwork, right? Right. But there's urgency. And it's a matter of urgency in the sense that when the painting, which I'll say is the inciting incident, which mm -hmm. you can explain in a second, when the painting does his cough and says the minister of magic wants to see you, it's an interruption in the way that basically they're like poo-poo this petty call with this president. Right. That, that matters not. Like, yeah, <laughs> we have something much more dire at hand to discuss. Well, and it's getting in the way of something concrete for the prime minister. He has a schedule and his life is already in chaos. Mm -hmm. So we'll get to the inciting incident, which we'll go deeper in this. So the inciting incident is basically the first moment of conflict that occurs and gets in the way, which you kind of just answered, but mm -hmm. go ahead and say it again. What is the inciting incident? Yeah. So here's a cough and why this cough is 
important is because every time he hears this cough, it means bad news is coming, essentially. What that cough, yeah. cough belongs to is a painting yeah. that is connected to the Minister of Magic's office, I'm assuming. Right. Uh-huh. And basically, the only times that the Minister of Magic has ever come, and the first time that Fudge does see the Prime Minister, he actually tells him, you'll never see me unless it's something serious. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we know. Yeah, I think it's a, and just a, a little side note, I think that's a really brilliant move because this is done, setting up a sense of feeling and an emotion with an action is a really amazing thing, amazing tool that you can use yeah. to create suspense in stories. And we actually get this delivered through the narrative, the perspective of the prime minister. You can see it in film a lot. Like, yes, like typically the color white is perceived as good. But if you portray that as negative early in a story, like we'll say, this is one that just popped into my head, the white agents in the matrix, like that we get a sense of all of a sudden you start to associate emotion with something that has been established. So the cough immediately kind of says, creates the sense of dread. So it's just an interesting tool that writers well, can use. And another recent example is they do that in The Sandman, the show on Netflix, the good guys or the gods are all in black and the bad guys are all in white. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of, it's a fun reversal. Yeah. And I mean, it speaks to the importance of basically like you can't be fooled by one thing, right? Like it's just, it's, it doesn't matter. It matters what the author establishes right. as something to pay attention to. And, right. you know, if we're being a writer, you're God of your story. So right. what you establish is what goes. But if you set that up correctly, you'll create emotions and suspense with, our, with basically all you need is one scene to create that. And then we'll con- constantly expect it. Like horror films would do that really well. Like I think yeah. of, of a long time ago, but The Ring has like the static TV that I remember right. like, I didn't want to see any static on tv for a while like right. it creates it's a it's it's a powerful tool for writers cool and so i agree that was the inciting incident and then prime minister faces other conflicts that escalate until we reach a turning point which is the moment that the value of the scene shifts or things change so what do you see as the turning point this is the commandment that savannah and i had to sit with a while and we ended up coming to the same conclusion but I think that there, why this was difficult for me to define at first is because I had a hard time figuring out what the crisis question was, what the crisis decision was. Because as Savannah had recently said, the prime minister has a low sense of agency in the story. Mm-hmm. Amazingly, everything is still super interesting. But it's interesting because of what's happening in the world and because we have so much context to what those dangers really are because of the previous books. So that agency is still there. Now, the turning point for me, I think, is the moment, and I believe, I think that you said it was the same one. I think it's the moment where Fudge confirms that Voldemort is back. And we have moments of backstory woven into the narrative, really brilliant beats that show versus tell, like they do a, a balance again of showing and telling because we're seeing it through movement instead of just And then Fudge had all these times that he saw me before this time. And here's all the information that he shared in those times. We're actually seeing kind of mini scenes when they describe that of his his previous encounters with Fudge. But I say I say this because in in those backstories, one or multiple of them, they all deal with Voldemort on some scale other than the serious black escape. But essentially, he's saying that in the beginning, Voldemort is has gone away. And the prime minister is like, so he's died. And they're like, no, Dumbledore doesn't think that he's died. And yeah. now when he comes, he's basically Voldemort is back. And the prime minister is in this state of flux and confusion of, wait, he's alive? Yes, he's Fudge's windbag answer is basically a ramble on, well, how do you kill someone who can't die? <laughs> yeah. It's like create even more confusion for this poor muggle. But- well, and you can just see how wishy-washy kind of Fudge is as a person. He's just like, well, yeah, that, right. you know. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Which then would lead us to a crisis question because the turning point causes a crisis question, right, Savannah? Yes. And so the crisis question is based on what happened at the turning point, what kind of decision does the character face about moving forward? So is it going to be, you know, are they going to do X or are they going to do Y? Exactly. What will we say the crisis is here? I think the majority of this chapter following that Voldemort is back is actually resolution. So the, because we're going to have the climax is the action made on the crisis question. So if the crisis question is generalized in this way of what are you going to do with this information? And I had actually highlighted the same paragraph. I believe Savannah had highlighted this paragraph for her notes. Do you have it up with you? If not, I can read it. Yeah. So go ahead. 
Yeah. And this just to point out again, what Abigail said earlier is that prime minister doesn't have a lot of agency. So and it's because he's getting steamrolled by the minister of magic. So the conclusion we came to is that this paragraph reflects the crisis. Mm -hmm. So let me actually back up a page so I can read what comes right before it. Fudge took a great deep breath and said, prime minister, I am very sorry to have to tell you that he's back. He who must not be named is back. And then the prime minister says back. When you say back, he's alive. I mean, and then they kind of talk through what that means. Yes, alive, said Fudge. That is, I don't know, is a man alive if he can't be killed? Blah, blah, Mm -hmm. blah. But the point is, yes, he's alive. Then it says the prime minister did not know what to say to this, but a persistent habit of wishing to appear well informed on any subject that came up made him cast around for any details he could remember of their previous conversations. So the crisis question based on that context insinuates, yes, it's kind of this idea of what do I do with this? But specifically, because if you were to push me to be more specific Mm -hmm. and I would hopefully do the same to you, then the question would be not so much what generally do I do about this, but can I basically I don't want to look like an idiot. Can, how can I ask for more information about this? So it seems like I'm understanding somewhat what's going on, even though I feel right. completely in confusion and chaos. Well, or and do you just sit there? He's trying to grab hold of some kind of agency. And, yeah. you know, I think it's interesting because his decision to basically be like, oh, because what he responds with is, is Sirius Black with a uh, mm-hmm. who must not be named? And then Fudge is like, what? We're not talking about Sirius Black anymore. And it was all a mistake. So it's like he's trying to to grab onto some agency, get some even footing with your magic. And he's just like so out of his depth. Right. So it shows who he is. It shows how far removed the muggle prime minister is from mm-hmm. all this. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what we came up with. And, it, and it's interesting because this is not something I would recommend you do in all of your scenes. We want the characters to have more agency and to be able to make choices that have consequences. And in a way, this choice does have a consequence, right? Because he says, is Sirius Black with him? And then the consequences, he learns about Sirius Black and he's also dismissed. Like, oh, that's not even a thing anymore. Come on, you know, catch up. Right. So it's almost like what he was worried about. He kind of puts his foot in his mouth and, you know, gets treated like almost an idiot anyway. Right. Which only grows even more so when scripture comes into the scene. Right. You know, it's. You, I think we should pause real quick and talk about prices, questions, and what you're saying there with a sense of agency and why you wouldn't direct this for the majority of scenes, but why it also can be beneficial to some scenes. Now, the other thing that I'd like to point out is that we are not following Harry Potter right now. Right. So by the time that we are at book six, Harry Potter is probably, I mean, I, I think with each book, he's always active. Like he's always active. But his because his sense of agency is great, but it grows even more so with the stakes and analyzing the first books. Now, you analyzed the Sorcerer's Stone and I analyzed the Chamber of Secrets. And I found that there are quite a bit more chapters like this or scenes like this where Harry was a bit more passive and someone else took over the crisis question versus now as we're into the, these later books i don't see that quite as much right. with harry it only usually tends to happen if there's a lack of information and he doesn't know how to respond to something so i guess like what just curious out of your out of your knowledge or your your understanding of it why do you think that can happen a lot more in the middle grade books but not so much in these young adult books well i you know young adult is about taking that agency and growing into an adult so as children we don't have a ton of agency although i will argue that if if you're writing middle grade you do want the character to have agency even if even if it's just in the way that they respond so almost the scene is kind of a could be a setup for a middle grade type of scene where it's like the prime minister is choosing how to respond to something mm-hmm. that he has no control over mm-hmm. cuz he could have responded in many different ways but this way he responds shows us his character which is what we get in the early harry potter books when harry can't make you know the main decision Mm -hmm. so yeah i think that's my answer yeah no i think that's a good answer i'll add a little bit to that in the sense that i always emphasize that if you must have a character who lacks the amount of agency that we're looking for generally you have to make sure and i use the term they're not a dead duck i don't want them seeing doing nothing right that's boring. If they're just being told information and then accepting information, you lack conflict. And without conflict, there's no reason for the story to move forward, right? But right. there is prevalent, there's there's prevalent extreme conflict happening outside of this office, 
And while the prime minister doesn't need to face a life or death decision he needs to make in this moment, what is happening outside of the office beyond his control is life or death. So basically, like he's going to need to start to maybe get more involved. There are going to be more meetings with the minister of magic, something that he dreads, maybe and not even in the sense that basically he can do anything about it. But there is part of the resolution that we learned that they're going to start (laughs) basically the ministry of magic is not happy with the security level, the prime minister, because they're afraid that he's going to get the imperious curse put on him. And if that's the case, it would put people in danger. So we start to hear of basically this idea of what are you going to do about it? The crisis question maybe even expands beyond this, this asking a question. As we move forward into the chapter, it might expand upon into this idea of, do you accept the help or not? Even if he doesn't really have a say in that, he doesn't even yeah. have when he has help placed well, on him. <laughs> And it's interesting what you said, because the turning point, is it's almost like what changes is he's informed now. And because he's informed, he is an, aware of the actual danger. So it the turning point almost answers his original scene goal that you're talking about, the general scene goal of like yes. figuring out what's going on. Now he knows. And because he knows he's moving closer to that danger side of the spectrum. But and also another thing to point out on your same note, he's not passive. He's he tries to not appear like an idiot by saying, oh, you mean Sirius Black. Then he appears kind of like an idiot anyway. And and Fudge dismisses him. But also Fudge says, oh, and by the way, I was wrong, which then makes the prime minister feel pity for him. Yes. So there's reasons why it's OK that this that he's a little bit he doesn't have as much agency as he normally would. It's for a reason. We're showing how important it is that this has finally reached the muggle world and how out of the loop they've been. Yes. So let's talk about the resolution. Because if the climax is answering the question, that means that a large majority of this chapter is resolution. And sometimes I've had writers who worry that resolution, there's too much resolution. Right. So let's talk about what the resolution is in general and then why it works so well in this scene. For resolution, if the climax is he asks about Sirius Black, that means everything that follows is resolution, okay? So we go from basically, like Savannah had said, Fudge kind of is in this way of like, Sirius Black, no, he's dead, and we were wrong about him, and there's all of that reveal about Sirius, and of course, we have an attachment as readers to Sirius, so it's extra sad. Then he talks about basically everything that is a reveal of the oddities that have been happening in the muggle world and why they are actually basically caused, not basically, and why they're actually caused by Death Eaters in the, from the Wizarding world. Right. So we have this fusion of the muggle world now being tormented and leading to extreme deaths and dangers because of the Death Eaters and what they're doing at large. So we learn that the Death Eaters have reunited with Voldemort. We learn that they're responsible for the bridge collapse. We learn that they're responsible for the murders of Amelia Bones. And I'm forgetting her name again. Emily Um, Vance. Emily Vance. We also learned that the hurricane means that there's likely that there's been giants and that there's been a lot of ministry employed wizards who have been in charge of basically obliviating minds and changing perspectives of what really has gone on, probably for the safety of muggles, you know, and, and the sanity of muggles. So all of that going on. And we learn also there is that line about, uh, well, I mean, and then it leads up to what I debated. Was this the other turning point, which is the reveal that Fudge has been fired. Right. And that the new minister of magic is Rufus Grimger. And then we're actually going to get to meet him. So it's interesting. Fudge, we learned, has kind of been only put in this place of deliver my news. I don't have time for this. Introduce me. (laughs) Yes, introduce me. Update him so I don't have to deal with that confusion so that when I make my appearance, I can really say my two cents and get out of there. He's efficient. Yeah, very efficient. Like, go do my work, and then I can just come in and tell you how it's going to happen and leave. Right. So Rufus Scrimshire does come, and the prime minister gets that, we read it earlier, the appearance of the idea of his appearance in general already looked like someone who is stronger than Fudge. And we also see that he is abrupt and efficient. Yes. And when the prime minister, basically there's this conversation about we need to, the only reason it seems like Rufus Scrimshire is even coming after, other than being updated by Fudge, is that he wants to say, we're not happy with your line of defense. We're not happy with your security. 
And this is where, like you said, that the prime minister is doesn't have as much agency, but we do see his character through these actions, right? Because we see that he doesn't want to just be told what to do. And he gets irritated by, he got irritated with Fudge basically saying, have a, a, a glass of whiskey, I think, right. backstory or present. But in this one, he gets more irritated where basically he, he mentions, Rivet Scrimcher mentions Kingsley Shacklebot and he cuts him off. He says, you're not firing him. I like him. He's so efficient. Not right. Not bad of a complaining of a way, but essentially that idea. And he goes, well, it's because he's a wizard. And then he jumps yeah. back and changed that. But essentially, like what he's learning is that he is in danger. Be- and especially because he's in a position of power, he's especially in a place of danger that he needs to be surrounded by wizards for protection and not right. any- and like head oars. I think also that just shows again, like how the muggles in general don't have any agency over what's happening. And he doesn't like that. Right. So right. we're kind of hitting the same note in the scene over and over. But a question. So earlier you had said that we debated Fudge telling the prime minister he was fired could have Mm -hmm. been a turning point. Mm -hmm. Why did we not choose that? Yeah. And I think that's because I couldn't find a crisis question for that turning point where I could find more of a crisis question following Voldemort is back. When we go back to the question of what is the story really about? The big picture question. What is it really about is that the, the world is at war. It's not about prime minister. We need to take care of you. Right. Right. That's part of the war. So I don't think the chapter is really about the new minister of magic is here. And now you're going to have to deal with him because the story isn't about the prime minister, even though he's involved and impacted by this stuff. The story is about Voldemort is back. So that felt like the bigger turning point for me and caused more of a crisis question on do I ask for more of this? Do I try to get more involved in this? Do I try to pretend like I can understand what's following? It lent to more of a crisis than the sense of, all right, Rufus Scrimcher is the new minister. He's coming whether or not you want it or not. Like, basically, there's even a line of the painting announcing it. And he's like, well, you might as well come because I don't, it doesn't matter what I do. Like, didn't he write feel like a question, you know? Right. Yeah. And so the other thing, too, about what you just said is if we had the there's a new prime minister as the turning point, how does that create the sense of change we're looking for? And I think that was part of our argument was, well, it it doesn't really like the fact that there's a new prime minister doesn't change anything significant mm-hmm. So compared to something like Voldemort's back and we're at war. Mm-hmm. That knowledge puts it raises the stakes. It signals to the prime minister that he is in danger. So are the muggles, mm-hmm. which is something that the other option doesn't do. Right. And it's, and it's just goes to show that there can be complications and conflicts that are beyond just between the inciting incident and a turning point, right? right? And to raise the stakes, you can consistently raise the stakes, even in a resolution. So if you were to give, and this is where I always say, don't, as if you're writing and you're analyzing your scenes or analyzing another story scenes, don't overthink the words too much. I think you can really put yourself in a place of paralyzation if you, or sure, if you just basically obsess over the perfect words that could define a change in the scene and scenes are about change. So we need a change. But if you were to look at it, like you had said it earlier, Savannah, I think a really good one is uninformed to informed. Right. Right. And that is an external definition of change, value change, that impacts life or death, right? Because life, right. Or, life or death is happening regardless. But it also speaks to an internal change in the sense of something along the lines of being flustered or irritated or worried about the things right. happening in the muggle world to completely helpless. Right. right at the end. So it's like they go that change on both the internal and on the external level works best with Voldemort is back. First right. is like you said, when scripture comes, it complicates things because it's new and he's going to have to deal with this guy now. But like ultimately, it doesn't really create change. It's right. just we need to introduce you to this character and it's going to be more complicated because here he is. Right. Yeah. So it was a very hard scene to analyze. I'm Like I said in the beginning, I'm sure we could still overthink this and like <laughs> potentially change our minds. But I think all the reasons that Abigail just talked through, we can safely say that no matter how we describe it, we know that the world is in danger and it's affecting the muggles. And like she said, that's what this story is about. So, you know, I'm just thinking of if we're writing our own stories and we can't say those things, we can't see any kind of arc of change. Or let's say the only arc of change we saw is that the prime minister met Scrimmager. Mm -hmm. That's not enough. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, think of all the details that would be left out. And also, it doesn't really speak to Scrimshaw's character, right? Because Mm -hmm. it doesn't seem like he wants the time to to have to share all that information. It's about sharing the information, right? Yeah. What's happening? Yeah. And something that's interesting that I'll say this really quick, but we were talking about this the other day in my writing group that sometimes you have, like, you might start with a scene where you know that the character has to meet the new minister of magic. So maybe that's all the shell of the scene that you have. And then when you come back to it, you might say, okay, but that arc of change wasn't significant enough. I need to layer in more. So again, this is not something that you have to have every piece figured out before you write a scene, but you always want to look for that arc of change that makes the scene meaningful. Mm -hmm. One reason why I like the Muggle Prime Minister's point of view is because by this point, the readers are more savvy than him. So we know what like a dark mood gripping the nation could mean. We know what causes murders inside of a locked room with no obvious cause of death. So it kind of creates that dramatic irony in a way because we're like, oh gosh, we know some of what's coming. How is he going to react to this? I think that even though we're in young adult and I know that we've talked about humor a lot in a way because the reader has the upper hand in knowledge, yeah. sometimes we can find humor. And I mean, this chapter is not funny in the sense to, or intentionally meant to be funny, but there are funny things because the reader has more knowledge than the prime minister. And we're not laughing at the prime minister. Like we yeah. are sympathetic for his situation, but it is fun to play the role of, I know why. Yeah. I know why. Like it's starting to become even more, you're you're more involved now it feels as the yeah. reader. And you know that his day is just going to get worse, which we like to read about conflict. So, well, that's what story is again. W- without conflicts, there is no change, right? So. Yep. So I think I think that's a great place to end it. I know we went a little long today, but yeah, I mean, longer, but definitely interesting. And I thought a lot of great points. So we will move on next episode to Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, which is my favorite book there. Yeah. I mean, again, love so They're many of these favorite. books, <laughs> but I definitely felt most connect. I mean. I felt the most connected and moved maybe because I like to see the closure of things. Yeah. And the, and like you said, the characters developed and stuff. So I'm excited to do that one. I'm excited too, but also sad. Yeah. We have been talking off camera, off microphone about what we should do next because we like doing these first chapter episodes. So I don't think this will end with book seven, but we will see what that means. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we are so excited to have you on board with us. Yes. Thanks for listening and keep those comments and reviews and feedback and all that stuff coming. We like hearing from you guys. So let us know what you think. All right. Thanks, Savannah. I'll be Thank you, Abigail. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. So that's it for today's show. As always, I want to thank you so much for tuning in and showing your support. If you want to check out any of the links I mentioned in this episode, you can find them over at savannahgilbo.com forward slash podcast. And if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to the show because there's going to be another brand new episode coming out next week. If you're an Apple user, I'd really appreciate it if you took a few seconds to leave a quick rating and review. Your ratings and reviews tell iTunes that this is a podcast that's worth listening to. And in turn, that helps this show get in front of more fiction writers just like you. So that's it for today's show. I'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Until then, happy writing.